Welcome back to Sociology 226. This is Talcott Parsons, video one. In this video, I've got three goals. First, I'm going to introduce the life and work of Talcott Parsons with a little historical background. Next, I'm going to tell you about a key debate in sociological thought, agency versus structure. Finally, I'm going to show you how Parsons addresses this debate via his theory of social roles and social action. This will get you ready to do the readings. Let's do it. Talcott Parsons was undoubtedly the most influential American social theorist of his time. This is partly because of the historical context in which he wrote. Parsons' writing must be read against the anti-communist sentiment dominant in his time, which I've tried to show you on this historical chart. Again, lots of stuff happened in the 80 years documented here, but I just want to focus on a few events. Since Americans always seem to be starting wars, I divided wars from not wars, for your convenience. We've already covered the first four events. After the Second World War, what is most important here is the Marshall Plan, the European recovery program whereby the U.S. sent $13 billion in aid to the economies of Western Europe after the destruction caused by the Second World War. This was because of the Cold War, and the U.S. and allies trying to curb the influence of the USSR. This was matched by the USSR establishing satellite governments in Eastern Europe and Eurasia after the war ended. The Marshall Plan signaled an era of competition between the West and the Soviet Union that would only end with the fall of the Berlin Wall. After the Second World War, this competition was fought through proxy wars and also on other fronts, such as economic competition and also the space race, which I've indicated here. That's the space race between the USSR and the USA, not between those three billionaires. Back to the Cold War. Both the Korean War and the Vietnam War were instances whereby Western governments backed states under their influence and the Eastern communist states backed theirs. I've included the space race here because it shows another front of these proxy wars, which was a show of muscle through scientific discoveries often touted by the Soviet Union or American allies as the demonstration that their economic and political system was superior to that of the other. Throughout this period, there is also significant social change taking place in the United States. After the Second World War, until the 1970s, there is an American rise to dominance, rebuilding economies all across Western Europe and the rest of the world, building industry and establishing a solid middle class. The nuclear family of the nuclear age emerges as the prototypical American consumer family after World War II. The single breadwinner, stay-at-home mom, around two kids in the family, this is the norm in American society. So not only does the U.S. become the dominant state in geopolitics, but these normal social roles emerge in that historical context. Now we have some historical context. Let's look to Talcott Parsons. Parsons is born in Colorado Springs, 1902. His father was a Protestant minister. He attends Amherst College and moved to the London School of Economics for graduate work, supervised by Malinowski, a central figure in the history of sociocultural anthropology. Finally, he went to work at Heidelberg, where he was supervised by Max Weber's brother. There he became familiar with the work of Max Weber, who would be a founding influence in his personal career. Parsons is a crucially important figure in the history of American sociology, elected president of the American Sociological Association, 1949. Parsons referred to himself as an incurable theorist. Despite changes in the various stages of his career, theorizing general dynamics and social structure remains paramount. Here I will emphasize the different courses Parsons took but they were all in the same general direction. In the first stage, the general theory of action, the goal is coming up with the basic structures of any and all forms of action. The second stage, theorization of social action, is subsidiary to this first project. The goal is to come up with a basic sketch of the way that social sciences should study action in concert and the role that sociology should play there. Here we come to the important empirical work done on theorizing medicine, where Parsons spent time at the Massachusetts General Hospital, observing psychiatric treatment and doctor-patient relationships. 
You'll read some of that after this video. In the final stage and a top American sociology, Parsons looked to work on comparative sociological and political processes and the development of society. Here he spent a great deal of time addressing critics of his work and making some minor adjustments to the theory in this light. Of course, like most grumpy old people, he didn't budge much. Parsons' systematic study of social action represented a significant change of course for American sociology in the 1930s. To this point, American sociology had been very empirically focused. That's a big word. What do I mean by it? Well, under the influence of the Chicago School, namely Robert Park and Ernest Burgess, American sociology was aimed at the interpretive study of relatively small cases. The goals were to give small-scale accounts of social dynamics, and not to general theorizing. The focus, for the most part, was on ethnography, that is, the methods of first-person observation, and people had been generally resistant to the focus on power, capitalism, you name it, characterizing European sociology. Rather, there were isolated stories about small segments of society rather than a general, universally applicable, and comparable story about social order. Remember the last lectures on W.E.B. Du Bois, who was doing very similar work in Philadelphia. Instead of a micro-sociology of a tiny part of American life, Parsons wants us to look at society and societies in comparison. Rather than sociological minutia, he wants to look at social action. Capital S, capital A. Parsons returns from Germany, citing pretty much only European thinkers and dealing in extreme abstraction and changes the way that Americans do sociology and the sociologists America read. Now they return to Durkheim and Weber. Parsons changed the view of sociology from an empirically minded discipline, either in terms of participant observation or one doing quantitative work, to a theoretically laden comprehensive science sitting alongside economics, psychology, anthropology, political science, and all the rest. The key tension facing Parsons in his work, and sociologists ever since, is between agency on the one hand and structure on the other. Let's look at this a little more closely. Here I've included two questions that we need to answer in any comprehensive social theory. First, how do individuals express their will freely, and then, how do collective forces organize action? These two questions have come up to this point in Marx, Durkheim, and Weber. We'll explore their relative positions in a second. I want you to see the stakes of this debate in general. Think about your choices to come to Queens. Though each of us chose Queens for different reasons, you because you wanted to participate in homecoming, and me because I wanted to work close to the Grizzly Grill, we both joined this institution. Though none of us believe we are determined in our actions, the makeup of Queens and the activities going on here, like lighting the whole city on fire for homecoming, happen again and again. To what extent is life at Queens determined, subject to social regularity, and to what extent is it simply the product of spontaneous action? That's the question. Let me show you how these tensions play out in the work of the big three. Here I've come up with a spectrum of determinism versus voluntarism. We can define a complete determinism as a state where all action is determined by social forces, and free will is just a complete illusion. Here, the structures that surround us wholly determine how we live and act. Alternatively, there is an opposite state of existing in complete and total liberty, what we'll call voluntarism. Here, social order is simply the description of a million billion random acts which are not caused by structure. Of course, these are just ideal types. Neither total structure nor voluntarism is real outside of sociological terminology, but they do help us classify the work of the big three. Marx says our action is determined by our economic position. As individuals express their lives, he said in the German ideology, so they are. Human life and human consciousness are both expressed through productive forces how we eat, breathe, and dwell. You might say, oh, I came here to Queens for the ultimate Frisbee team, 4 a.m. trips to one of Bubba's two delicious locations, or a once-in-a-lifetime experience at the castle. And you can guess what Marx would say. No, you're just reproducing the dominant economic order. 
Marx is a determinist who makes little to no room for free will. Durkheim, too, focuses on structures that determine action. Remember, he's interested in how social forces exist outside of our consciousness and restrict our behavior. But he also states that individualism is a social product, a result of the collective consciousness, and how we make social forces our own is what makes us what we are. So in my reading, at least, Durkheim belongs after Marx on the spectrum. He allows us more individual volition than Marx, even if the terms are on loan from the type of society that allows us that individuality. Finally, we have Max Weber. Remember that the key to Weberian sociology is trying to understand the mindset of an individual agent in an historically informed setting. Weber says that we cannot hope to find the 100% true, once and for all mode for understanding the motivations for action. We can get close. We can get close, however. For this reason, I have placed him to the voluntarist side of things. Sociology can try and examine the will, but it cannot explain it away by appealing to social context alone. To return to my Queen's example, in order to stop the homecoming partying, the city can try and dissuade individuals from acting a certain way. You know, bylaws, extra police on the street, and court summons. They've done almost everything they could. Try as they might, they will never be able to totally determine the course of student and alumni action, because action can never be totally understood. To establish a typical Queen student and guess at what makes them act is, in a sense, also an act of Weberian sociology. With an understanding of agency and structure in place, let's see how Parsons tries to resolve this debate, looking to his influences. Parsons was very much influenced by Max Weber, attending the same university he taught at five years after his death, and it is through his reading of Weber that we get his reading of Durkheim. Parsons found that a lot of people hadn't been reading Durkheim right. There wasn't some large group mind controlling us all of the time, but rather a shared set of morals that we use to direct behavior. Here I've indicated the sort of compromise that Parsons comes up with. He believes that individuals are, to some extent, determined by social structure. It produces the roles that we occupy, and an individual socialized into a role is an agent. To this extent, he follows Durkheim. But he argues that agents act in concert, just like Weber said, in oriented individual action. To this extent, he is a Weberian. Society doesn't determine our consciousness, but it does give us a set of options through which we can express ourselves. These come as social roles. A student, a teacher, a skateboarder. One's mind isn't determined when you act in such a role, but it comes with a set of duties and obligations of behavior, the same moral attachments that Durkheim outlined. Lastly, Parsons' economic influences. Notably absent is Karl Marx. Parsons was influenced by the work of the great British economist Alfred Marshall, whom he started working on when he got to Harvard. Marshall was extremely important in popularizing economic charts and notation, as well as crucial understandings of the firm, of surplus, etc. When we do economics today, we follow Marshall's lead. At least the literature says. Parsons was very interested to find out how Marshall included sociological phenomena and relationships, or if they were simply external to the workings of the market. Secondly, Parsons was also reading the work of Italian mathematician, economist, and sociologist Vilfredo Pareto. Parsons reads these four dudes together, Durkheim, Weber, Pareto, and Marshall, because he wants to account for agency and structure in social systems, how we occupy social roles to maintain social order. Weber plays most prominently here, and Marx doesn't get much of a reading at all. Parsons says he got all he needed on the economy from Weber and the economists, so Marx was unnecessary. Let's finish up this video with a discussion of action and how it relates to social roles. Remember Weber's theorization of social action? We find a very similar definition of action in Parsons. Parsons doesn't only want to interpret action, he wants to account for why it is regularized and how it contributes to social order, something Weber did not want to do. Thus, he is interested in a less humble, more Durkheimian account of action, 
just like the system used by economists to this day, not just to interpret social action, but to explain it. Here we see the four components outlined in the 1937 book, The Structure of Social Action. Acts must have one, an actor, two, an end goal, take place in three, a cultural situation, and four, express preference when preferences are possible. That is, they are normative. At first sight, this looks to be a definition very similar to that of Weber. That's because it is. But recall the agency structure debate and my mention of social roles beforehand. Parsons is interested in explaining the actions of agents in their social roles, not just the motivations of an individual person. To clarify this, I thought I'd look to a TV show set in Parsons' time. Mad Men. Don't worry, you don't have to have seen the show to get what I'm talking about. Let's use the example of John Hamm's character, Don Draper. Draper is a high-powered Madison ad executive known for smooth talk and love for hard drink. Did I mention he has a shady past? Oh my god, does he ever. Total package, everybody. Now I want to talk about the social roles at work in the 1950s. Again, the goal of Parsons' work is to explore the actions of a socially defined agent. I've picked five roles that Don Draper operates within. Remember, this show was set in the 50s and 60s when the nuclear family was the model family. Let's see how Draper plays these roles. Draper is a father and the expectations of the 50s father are to be the breadwinner outside of the house and the boss when he gets home. But he's just dreadful at it. He doesn't care about the home and leaves most of the parenting to his poor wife, Betty. Don is an awful husband, too. Not only is he running around on poor Betty all the time, but he also divorces her and marries his secretary. Remember, this is the 1950s and people stayed in lousy marriages just for the sake of occupying the normal family position, for the economic benefits and for the fear of being cast out of their social circles. Most of the time, Draper just naps at work and makes his secretary do all the work for him, when he isn't schmoozing on them. The obligations men in the workforce had were very different than those of women, who were supposed to do work until they found a husband and then stay home. This same expectation is going to be found in Parsons' exploration of the school system. I write patient when I should write potential patient. When Draper isn't sleeping at work or with whomever he can, he's slamming old-fashioned cocktails and making terrible decisions. Remember, in the 1950s, it was perfectly okay to drink and smoke in your office with your co-workers. Finally, I don't want to spoil the middle of the show for you, but Draper also has a secret past as a soldier, where he replaced his identity with that of another guy to get out of the Korean War. I don't think I need to tell you that you're not supposed to do that. The reason I've said all this is to make a simple point. Actors are not just people, in terms of you or me, they are the way you or I exist in one of these kinds of social roles, which have their own duties and expectations that come with them. In order for the social system to sustain itself, we must act through these roles in coordinated ways. This is what we mean when we talk about Parsons as a structural functionalist. How roles dictate and yet reproduce systematic order. That's it for me. As you go through the readings, think about the different ways that social roles are made and maintained in the hospital setting. See you in the next video.